The Riddle of the Universe by Ernst Heinrich Heckel which is probably what his audience did when they listened to him. Anyway, I'm sure he was tired of that joke, even though he was German, so he probably wouldn't have gotten it. 1834 to 1919. This is the work on the philosophy of nature. Published in 1899. So the principal ideas are, a scientific philosophy must join experience with speculation, the greatest triumphs of science, including the cellular theory and the theory of evolution, are philosophical achievements. In a scientific age, a monistic philosophy is necessary, one in which matter and spirit are abstractions from a single physical nature, attributes of the universal substance. Man is distinguishable quantitatively, but not qualitatively, from the lower animals. Heckel was one of the leading biologists of the 19th century, best known today for his formulation of the biogenetic law. Ontogenesis is a brief and rapid recapitulation of phylogenesis, which is not actually accepted really much anymore. But the idea is that the embryo of an animal in its development passes successfully through stages in which it resembles adult forms of its evolutionary ancestors. He was the first German biologist who wholeheartedly supported Darwin's theories in the popularization of which he did for Germany what Thomas Henry Huxley did for England. In Die Weltrechtel, literally The World of Riddles, which was an enormously popular book, he attempted to present an overall picture of the universe and man's place therein, in accordance with the new insights of evolutionary theory. Despite the suggestion of mystery in the title, the work was emphatically not sceptical. As far as Haeckel, Haeckel was concerned, the world riddles had been solved. In 1880, the eminent physiologist Emile dubois Raymond enumerated seven enigmas. One the nature of matter and force, two, the origin of motion, three, the origin of life, four, the apparently preordained orderly arrangement of nature, five, the origin of simple sensation and consciousness, six, rational thought and the origin of speech, seven, the question of the freedom of the will. dubois Raymond declared the first, second and fifth to be utterly transcendental and insoluble the third, fourth, and sixth to be possibly soluble, and he professed ignorance as to which group the seventh belonged. The question is freedom of the will, yes. I understand his confusion. On the contrary, wrote Heckel, the transcendental problems are settled by the monist conception of substance. The third, fourth, and sixth are already decisively answered by the th theory of evolution, while the freedom of the will is not an object for critical scientific inquiry at all, for it is a pure dogma based on a, an illusion and has no real existence. The 19th century, drawing to its close, as Heckel wrote, was the century of science. It was great advance, it saw great advances in chemistry, particularly in the chemistry of carbon. In physics, the unity of forces in the entire universe was at last established as well as the highly important law of substance, encompassing the principles of conservation for energy and matter. The greatest discovery were in biology, the cellular theory and organ organic evolution. Technical progress in every field was immense. All this should have affected a revolution in philosophy, but it did not. Because of churchly opposition to enlightenment in conjunction with the political policies of ignorant and reactionary lawyers, the progress of science has not been equaled in moral and social life. And I quote from Heckel, And from this obvious conflict there have arisen not only an uneasy sense of dismemberment and falseness, but even the danger of grave catastrophes in the political and social world. End quote. Anthropomorphism, 
and I quote again, that powerful and worldwide group of erroneous opinions which opposes the human organism to the whole of the rest of nature and represents it to be preordained, end of the organic, the preordained end of the organic creation, an entity essentially distinct from it, a godlike being, still reigned. Anthropomorphism, that is. It could only be thrown, overthrown by a scientific philosophy. In his scientific philosophy, Heckel intended to join experience with speculation. Plato and Hegel on the one hand, Bacon and Mill on the other, were too one-sided. Which if you know, if you know anything about Hegel, you will realize that is a hell of a misrepresentation of Hegel. In fact, it's the complete opposite of Hegel. Anyway, I digress. I quote, The greatest triumphs of modern science, the cellular theory, the dynamic theory of heat, the theory of evolution and the law of substance are philosophical achievements, not, however, the fruit of pure speculation, but of antecedent experience of the widest and most searching character. End quote. At the time, there were two prevailing kinds of philosophy. Dualistic, or supernatural, and monistic. Monism in the tradition of Spinoza and Goethe held that matter cannot exist and be operative without spirit, nor spirit without matter. It is therefore distinct from materialism. But Heckel, of course, regarded the classical and 19th century materialists as allies against supernaturalism. A monistic worldview was inevitable once the implications of the law, the laws of substance and of evolution had been grasped. The place of man in nature had to be clearly specified. Heckel expounded the facts of comparative anatomy to show that man is a vertebrate, a tetrapod, a mammal, a placental, a primate, a catarine, and among the catarines, much more closely to the anthropoid apes than the latter are to the Sinopithecae on the next rung down. He outlined the evolutionary explanation of this classification. According to Heckel, if man is continuous physically with the rest of nature, so he is also in soul. For, and I quote, we consider the psyche to be merely a collective idea of all the psychic functions of protoplasm. In this sense, the soul is merely a physiological abstraction like assimilation or generation. End quote. Psychology is a section of physiology. In accordance with this conception, Heckel presented a mass of data of the sort later emphasized by the behaviorist psychologists in the attempt to show that gradations of sensibility, spontaneous movement, reflex action and memory correspond in their complexity to the degrees of organization of the evolutionary scale. Man is not distinguishable qualitatively, only quantitatively. From the lower animals with respect to intelligence, emotions, and even language. Indeed, Heckel argued, there is a greater difference between Goethe and an Australian than between an Australian and a dog. I'm just quoting here. I'm just a messenger. We are not told why the alleged fact is not a counter instance to the correlation of bodily structure and mental ability.
The riddle of the universe states that psychic qualities, like bodily ones, are inherited. They are determined at the moment the sperm cell penetrates the ovum. But Heckel agreed with Chevalier de Lamarck that acquired characteristics can to some degree be passed on to ascendants, to descendants. He was aware of but rejected August Weissman's theory of the continuity of the germplasm in an individual psychic life runs the same evolution, upward progress, full maturity and downward degeneration as every other vital fact activity of the organism. I'll quote that again. In an individual psychic life runs the same evolution, upward progress, full maturity, and downward degeneration as every other vital activity in his organization. End quote. For Heckel, the will, a simply one mode of psychic activity, is thoroughly determined by heredity and adaptation. Consequently, there could be no question of exceptions from the iron laws of nature. Consciousness, which Heckel distinguished from sensibility, is described as the central mystery of psychology. Heckel pointed out that much psychic life in man as well as in other animals is unconscious, and that the higher animals are obviously conscious too, as the comparative physiological event effects of narcotics, anaesthetics and hypnotism de demonstrate. But where consciousness begins on the scale of animal life is impossible to de determine. Perhaps the centralization of the nervous system is a prerequisite. Heckel did not believe that consciousness is an inherent property of all matter, but he argued that unconscious sensation and will do pertain essentially to matter. In man and the higher animals, at any rate, brain physiology has succeeded in locating the actual seat or preferably organ of consciousness. Belief in the immortality of the soul, that highest point of superstition, is not universal, not occurring in Buddhism, Confucianism, or early Judaism. The typically Christian idea is thoroughly materialistic and anthropomorphic, said Heckel, being that of the resurrection of the body. The more metaphysical conception, stemming from Plato, really amounts to the theory that the soul is a gas, but if it were, Heckel observes with ponderous Teutonic wits, we could then catch the soul as it is, breathe out at the moment of death, condense it and exhibit it in a bottle as immortal fluid. Fluidum anime immortali. By a further lowering of temperature and increase of pressure, it might be possible to solidify it to produce soul snow. The experiment has not yet succeeded. I was quoting Heckel there, by the way, and think you've got, in case you think I've gone mad. And in any case, he wrote, it would be a dreadful thing if the soul were immortal. So much for man. As for the universe at large, the fundamental principle for its understanding is the law of substance, which, I quote, in the ultimate analysis is found to be a necessary consequence of the principle of causality. End quote. Taking energy to be the same as Spinoza's thought, Heckel declares, to this profound thought of Spinoza, our purified monism returns 
after a lapse of 200 years for us to matter filling substance and energy which is moving force are but two inseparable attributes of the one underlying substance end quote Matter is of two sorts, the ordinary kind and as ether, the existence of which as a real element is a positive fact and has been known as such for the last 12 years, says Heckel. This is obviously the time he's writing. The relation of these two is, Heckel admits, obscure. Perhaps matter is a sort of condensation from ether. Empedocles was right in principle in making love a cosmic force, for there is a unity or of affinity in the whole of nature from the simplest chemical process to the most complicated love story. The universe is a perpetual motion machine, infinite in extent, extent and duration. Processes within it are cyclic, and I quote, hence the theory of entropy is untenable, end quote. Because it would, if it were true, the universe would have a beginning and an end, a state of affairs, and I quote, untenable in the light of our monistic and consistent theory of the eternal cosmogenic to cosmogenetic process, end quote. Heckel outlines the history of the class of life, though he holds that living creatures must have originated spontaneously at some time. He does not speculate on the details of this. And of man, teleology, Heckel observes, has long been banished from the inorganic sciences, which are consequently atheistic. Darwin banished it from biology too. It is not only fruitless, but in error ever to regard evolution as a purposive process, as is shown by instance of dysteleology, such as the survival of the vermiform appendix. Heckel put himself in opposition to all philosophy of history. The phrase survival of the fittest carried no moral obligations for him, no moral implications for him, while all processes originally determined, they are at the same time subject to chance in the sense of absence of aim or purpose. The riddle of the universe deals with theory of knowledge, but somewhat sketchily. Sensations synthesized by association in consciousness produce sensations. Internal pictures of the external objects given us in sensation. By comparison, we know that there is a consensus of normal observers, the presentations of normal observers, we call true, and we are convinced that their content corresponds to the knowable aspects of things. We know that these facts are not imaginary but real. Skeptical objections, that the brain or the soul only perceives a certain condition of a stimulated nerve, and that consequently no conclusion can be drawn from the process as to the existence and nature of the stimulating environment, are dismissed by arguing that in the evolutionary process the different sense organs have developed their specific specificity, specificity to various classes of stimuli by adaptation from originally undifferentiated sense cells. I quote, The presentations which fill up the gaps in our knowledge or take its place may be called, in a broad sense, faith. End quote. For Heckel, a conception of knowledge such as positivism, attempting to dispense with theories and hypotheses, is impossible. Religious faith, however, is quite a different thing from scientific hypotheses. Since the former is incompatible with the facts of evolution, with the fact of observation, I meant. The remainder of the book is devoted mostly to, to a polemic against Christianity in general and Roman Catholicism in particular, 
and to an outline of monist, monist religion and ethics. In this section occurs the famous description of the god of popular religion as a gaseous vertebrate. The world system of the modern scientist is pantheism. Atheism is, and I quote, only another expression for it, emphasizing its negative aspects, the non-existence of any supernatural deity, end quote. The three goddesses of the monist are truth, beauty, and virtue. Goodness consists in, char in charity and toleration, compassion and assistance. Ethics can be scientific for, con for science shows that the feeling of duty rests on the solid ground of social instinct. Egoism and altruism are both natural laws and equally indispensable. The golden rule found in many cultures antedating Christianity is the supreme principle. While Christ was an admirable man, and I quote, the noble prophet and enthusiast, so full of the love of humanity, end quote, he was far below the level of classical culture even though his father was Greek. So Heckel informs us. Even purified Christianity is ethically objectionable in despising egoism. And I quote, If any man will take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Translated into the terms of modern politics means when the pious English take from you simple Germans one after another of your new and value, valuable colonies in Africa, let them have all the rest of your colonies also, or best of all, give them Germany itself. End quote. In despising the body, Christianity leads to dirtiness. In denying souls to animals, it condones cruelty. In despising earthly goods, it is inimical to civilization. In de deprecating sex, it dishonors love and the family. But Heckel believed that science was on the march and would someday supersede much of Christian dogma. The free societies of monists, he predicted, would decorate not only would decorate not only not with Madonnas and crucifixions, but with paintings of the beauties of nature, such as the radial aria, the thalamophora, and the medusae. Heckel had the type of mind to which broad outlines are more congenial than fussy details. This was evident even in his biological researches, and though throughout his life he served honorably, even her heroically, in the forefoot of the battle for freedom of thought and liberal politics against entrenched reaction and bigotry, he was nevertheless tenacious, even vain of his own opinions, tending always to answer criticism with abuse. In consequence, even the biological sections of the riddle of the universe present present as settled facts many theories which were exploded, or at least qualified, at the time of writing. Outside biology, Heckel had no competence at all, as his ludicru ludicrously dogmatic remarks on ether and the law of entropy make painfully clear. The monism that Heckel served up as the new philosophy is almost too vague for criticism. To say merely that entities, so primary facey, disparate as sensation, will, and life are inherent properties of one substance, is not to produce a philosophy, much less a monistic one, in any but a trivial verbal sense. The main objection to Heckel as a philosopher is that he fails to come to grips at all with those problems that are incumbent upon a thinker of his point of view to treat, principally the well-known epistemological objections against identifying consciousness with brain activity. It is not enough just to show, however elaborately, that without a brain there is no thought. Nevertheless, to show the absolute necessity of the brain itself to thought is the is indispensable first step to a satisfactory philosophy of mind, and if today we can take it for granted and pass immediately to perhaps subtler theorizing, we can do so only because Heckel, among others, in the 19th century transformed into solid fact what from Lucretius to Dietrich von Holbach had been only speculation. In this and other respects, 
Heckel deserves some sort of praise or homage for having helped to create a general climate of opinion in which a more satisfactory scientific philosophy can be worked out. That man, including his soul, is a part of nature and not exempt from scientific study is now an exempt axiom of educated thought everywhere except in a few citadels of medievalism. It was not so when Heckel wrote, when Darwin was forbidden to be mentioned in the German schools and had not even been heard of in Tennessee. The modern reader may find it quaint that Heckel argues so solemnly for conclusions that are now commonplace. His boisterous attacks on religion may even be deemed offensive, being contrary to the amiable doctrine that there has never been a war between science and religion. But there was, to paraphrase Galileo, and even those who find it convenient to assume that at any rate the war has been terminated, should not be so ungrateful as to refuse Heckel some gratitude for this happy state of affairs.